gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the life that you've given us, the peace, the joy, the strength that comes through knowing you. I thank you for the opportunity you've given us to continue to study your word together, to feast upon it, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. I ask that you'd filter out all of that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and the snow is gone here in southeastern Oklahoma. We went from a uh, minus 10 degrees to uh, uh, a 75 degrees in just a matter of two days. We've been studying together in the book of Revelation, and I thank you all for your continued interest and your participation. Um, I thank you all for your continued prayers for the direction of this ministry. There are 18 things in this chapter that have never happened yet. That's what makes it difficult for me to see this as uh, to take the preterist view. We're looking at a prophetic book, and we've seen a lot since we started this study. Hard to view this uh, uh, as history when none of the judgments that we see here has ever happened on this scale. Chapter 16, verse 8, in the fourth angel, we're looking at the bold judgments. The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire as we can speculate all we want on that but the truth of the of the matter folks is when we come to these these verses there's very little that we can say that that's dogmatic you know about it we can we can say that you know that's uh a uh, uh to for the angel to pour out his vial upon the the sun and 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 men would be scorched with fire you know we can go down our list of things as uh, as far as trying to to physically uh, describe the the cause of that and that's not the purpose of this study uh, if you've come here for that I'm, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed all we know is what the text says and men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God which hath power over the, these plagues and I want you to to note, take note of the fact that, that when we see the word plagues, our, our minds automatically jump to, you know, pestilence or, you know, the coronavirus or some other form of, of uh, pestilence. And the word in the Greek, folks, literally means wounds. They are wounded by this great heat. And they repented not. Even after this, they repented not to give him glory. And it's, it's, it's through our overall understanding of the nature of man, the fall, the total depravity of man, that we come to understand why they didn't repent. They didn't repent, folks, because they could not repent. All of those for whom Christ died will repent. So we're obviously looking at those who are not His. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the sea, okay, uh, or the seat uh, of the beast, the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. Now, do we take that as literal or we t do we take that as figurative? I don't know. You decide. Uh, it's We do have a verse, Behold, I come as a thief, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. 
Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So we have verses that talk about darkness as being spiritual, but we also have verses that talk about darkness as being literal. Uh, if you want my opinion on this, uh, it is, uh, it's probably a combination of both. Uh, and they nod their tongues for pain. And they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. Uh, said verse 2. And repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. If it's really hot... And God has, has used the sun to scorch men with heat. I can understand how the, the, even the great river Euphrates would, would be dried up as a result of that. So it could be that these are interconnected, that they're related to one another, that they're not separate, even though they're separate bowls. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs like frogs come out of the, the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet for they are the spirits of the spirits of devils so the text describes what these are working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God almighty for those in the tribulation period the 70th week of Daniel uh, my heart goes out to them and I can only imagine the heart of a loving Heavenly Father that was putting His children through such suffering. Bear in mind that no matter what hits your life, it pains God more than it does you. Verse 16, And He gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. They fight north around the city of Jerusalem where we know Jerusalem falls, Zechariah 14. Uh, I, I highly suggest that all of you take the time to read Zechariah 14. It'll show you where we're at right here in Revelation, in our study here. The city's taken, the houses are rifled, the women are ravished, the city's destroyed. The Lord will stand upon the Mount of Olives, but before He stands on the Mount of Olives, the city is destroyed. There's a great earthquake, and it looks like the, uh, the real battle between the Lord and the armies uh, begins around Basra, works north. Uh, around the valley of Jezreel and winds up in the plain of Megiddo. The beast is involved in a conflict with Christ as Christ fights for His people as He did in the day of battle and other nations are attacking Babylon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl on the air and the text says, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is finished. Where have we heard that before? The last time we heard that expression was the Lord on the cross. It is finished. Here God is declaring that the pouring out of this bowl completes the judgments that He's decreed on the evil world system. As a result of that, there were voices, thunders, lightnings, and a great earthquake, such as not since man was upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And that has never happened. We know from Zechariah that, in fact, it, it makes a great valley. It looks as though the Mediterranean and the Red Sea are connected. And there's a great fault that goes down through there. And many have suggested that maybe that's going to happen. And these, these people are geologists. And they've said that without reading any Scripture. I'm told that 
there's a great valley. There's a place that nobody knows. It's uh, it, it's mentioned in Zechariah 14. Nobody knows what that place is, where that is. But they will when this happens. They'll know then. And that's where the Israelites, that's where the Jews are going to flee for safety. We read in Zechariah, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal, Azal. Nobody knows where that is. There's no written uh, work prior to uh, the late 19th century that definitely identifies what or where Azal is or, or, or was. Most Bible commentators of the late 19th century considered it to be a, a place near Jerusalem. Ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the, the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee, and it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light, and the great city is divided into three parts. Sounds just like what we're studying here. So Jerusalem is called the great city in uh in 11.8, okay, if you remember, Jerusalem was called the great city. Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. You know, we need to understand, folks, words have meaning. Context, context, context. Context trumps the rule of first occurrence. When we see a word, it's not always necessarily defined by the first occurrence, even though that is a general rule. Uh, the meaning is tied to the context. You know, I'm going to write a book, and uh, chapter one, uh, I, I'm going to tell you about my childhood and how much I loved to play ball. Okay, I, the first baseman, baseball, I'm, pl I'm the first baseman. And then we get to the, uh, you get to the seventh chapter of my book, and I tell you that I met my wife, and I was so thrilled when I met this girl that I took her to a ball. You know, we had a real uh, good time. Uh, we had a ball. It was great. And so you go back in your word study, and you say, well, you know, first use of that word, you know, he was the first baseman. So that's what it means. He was, he was the first baseman when he met his, this girl. Well, that's wrong. You understand what I'm saying? Bible study words have definitions. But words only have meaning in context. Why would Babylon be named separate from the great city if the great city is Babylon? And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Never going to be inhabited again. Cyrus decided that, that he was going to take the city. Well, you know, Babylon is, is built on both sides of the river Euphrates. The river Euphrates is a big river. It's pretty wide. Uh, I think 1,300 feet is the average width, but sometimes it's a mile wide. He built the city of Babylon on both sides, and the river flowed right through the city, and they had gates, and it fell that night. How did it fall? They killed Belshazzar. Seventy-five percent of the inhabitants of Babylon welcomed Cyrus. Glad to see him because they hated Belshazzar. Cyrus made it one of his capitals for a long time. The city has never, ever been desolate. The west side of the river, the, the Babylon part on the west side of the river, the ruins are still there. That's where you know, Saddam Hussein was going to try to rebuild part of it uh, you know, as a tourist 
sort of, uh, you know, site. But the part on the east side is still there. About 20,000 people live there today and all through history. If you'll just follow it down through the history, uh, Babylon's always been there. It was still a decent city 400 years after Christ. Never was it utterly destroyed. Babylon came into remembrance before God. He said it years before Christ. To give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. You know, folks, I wonder if we, real, if we realize how much God hates sin. You know, today we suffer as a result of man's sin, not his wrath against sin. We don't suffer because of our sin or the sin of the ungodly. And here, his own will suffer as a result of his wrath on the ungodly. But God personally has nothing against his own people. Folks, God has nothing against you. If we really love the Lord, we don't want to sin. We know we sin. We know we sin. We don't want to sin, but sin becomes almost sometimes almost too casual. Because our sin debt has been paid. There is no sin that you have ever committed or ever will commit that is not that hasn't been already fully paid for in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. But Steve, you know, are you saying that you can just sin with impunity? You know, I'll just tell you, I'll just say it. Yes, yes. The answer is yes. I am. Folks, if the love of God for you, His willingness to die in your place, is such a casual thing to you, that, that you would just go live in sin, then I don't understand that. I've said this many, many times. Our sins are paid for in Christ, and somebody always says, somebody's always saying, well, you mean I can sin all I want to and still go to heaven? And my answer to that is I already sin more than I want to. And I'm going to heaven. And that is solidly true. Now, and you cannot change, folks, that truth by what you do. I'm willing to tell you a lot more. I sin a lot more than I want to, but I know I'm going to heaven. If I want to know what God thought of sin, I have to look at Jesus Christ. The sovereign God who spoke the worlds into existence became your kinsman. And He died in your place when He hung on the cross. You know, He could have just completely annihilated everybody in the city of Jerusalem with the blink of His eye. He could have easily come down from the cross. They didn't take His life, folks. He gave it. Okay? And He gave it for you. That's what sin meant to God. That He would become your kinsman, your relative. You know, to let sinful creatures use Him despicably and put Him to death so that your sin might be forgiven how do, how do you walk through your life folks in, in regard to that fact how does that affect your life does that make you want to go out and just sin any as much as you want to you cannot say that your sin was not judged folks you cannot say that your sin was not judged of course it was judged Jesus Christ took it. He bore your sin in His body on the tree. And contrary to what is so widely being taught today, you did absolutely nothing, nothing to initiate that very special process of new birth. You were born again by His will, not your will. 
John, John 1 13 makes it clear. You had to be quickened to life first because you were spiritually dead and then as a result of that quickening to life you then and only then did you have the ability to to repent to receive to be baptized to believe or anything else before that occurred that quickening to life you were spiritually dead and you could not you could not could not do anything and yet modern christianity has turned this completely around. And they put the cart before the horse and they've made it a mandate, a prerequisite that God can only do what He does if you first do something. And that, folks, is a lie. It's a lie. This book does not say that. And that's gotten me in a, into a lot of trouble. I, folks, that is what how that is why we suffer for the sake of Christ. If you do not understand that and preach that, if that is not your message, okay, then you don't you have yet to come to understand what it means to suffer for the sake of Christ. You're not going to be popular, okay, at all. I know I would be getting more views if, if I if I preached the, the modern gospel that you know you, you needed to do something to be redeemed and, and if you would just do this that the other thing that God would then do His part and I I would be popular I'd be loved I would be uh, I'd, I there's no telling how many views that these videos would get but that is not what our generation and the generations that have come before us for the past 400 years have been taught. Folks, we were born again by a very, a, a very special process that was a work of the Holy Spirit of regeneration. That's being born again. The word means born again, regeneration, and renewal. Both were a work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You didn't regenerate yourself or transform yourself or renew yourself or renew your mind or suddenly decide that you were going to do something to merit God's favor. And of course, I've really completely strayed away from the text here. Verse 20, And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Is that a pole shift? I don't know, folks. I, I think it is. The stars falling from the heavens, the, the tectonic plates moving, the continental shift. Uh, you know, it, everything that we're looking at in the bold judgments looks to me as if another celestial body passes by Earth and gravitational forces uh, just wreak havoc on the Earth's natural balance of things. There fell upon man a great hail out of heaven. Every stone, every stone about the weight of a talent. You're looking at a hundred pounds, okay, of hail, hailstones. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. You, you would, you'd have to, st you gotta wonder, you know, even at that point, and they're still blaspheming God, and they're still refusing to repent, they can't, folks. They can't. And again, I want to point out, because of the plague of the hail, for the plague okay, thereof was exceeding great. So we've got hail associated with plague. So this hail brings uh, some pestilence. Again, the word, folks, for plague simply means wound. Okay, If a 100-pound hailstone lands near you, well, if it lands on you, you're dead. If it lands near you, you're anywhere near you, you're going to be wounded by that. Just like you're going to be wounded by the scorching heat of the sun. That's what the word plague in the, in the text, uh, that's what the word means. Look at the effects. 
uh, the sun. These judgments, they affect the sun, the earth, the death of sea creatures, the rivers, the fountains of waters, the, anything, any waters, the, they become undrinkable. They become poisoned. Blood, much blood. The men scorched with great heat. Uh, the seed of the beast, uh, great darkness over his kingdom. Uh, there's tongue gnawing, there's, there's pain, there's sores, there's devils working miracles, there's great deception. The, the river Euphrates, a mighty river, dried up, dried up, gathering together for battle uh, of these nations. Great earthquake, greater earthquake than there's ever been. The great city divided into three parts. The cities of the nations falling, every island fleeing away, mountains not found. Great hail, the size of, you know, a hundred pound hail. Uh, buildings, cities, structural collapse, continental shifts, probably a polar shift. Solar flares. And if our Lord didn't return, that'd be the end. that'd be that'd be the end of it. It is that great. I want you to stop today and consider just how blessed that you are. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. It doesn't matter what happens to you. You will never step foot one foot inside Daniel's seventieth week, but in your life. With all of the trials, the hardships, the tribulations, the heartaches, the breakups of the family and relationships and losing your, your pet pets and your loved ones and you, just the list goes on. You stub your toe. You know, I had a horse step on my toe the other day. I didn't feel very great. And it, it, it's just, I guess my point being, the point here that I'm trying to make is that despite everything that we're going through when we look at when we're looking at this present context folks it kind of it, it really does it's 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 almost impossible not to see that everything that we go we're going through no matter what it is pales sharply pales in comparison to what's coming We're looking forward, folks, to that, that day in which there's a new heavens and a new earth in which the world is ruled by Christ in justice, in judgment, uh, righteous judgment, ruling with a rod of iron, a world that's filled with peace and righteousness, love, not hate. We're not there yet, but we're inching ever so closer to that time and it will come that time will come I pray for you all constantly I want you to know that I pray that the Lord would meet all of your needs both physical and spiritual but I know that he's met your needs spiritual spiritually you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ the question is is do you know that that's the question it's not that you're lacking and coming behind in any spiritual grace the question is is do you realize and understand the abundance of blessings that you've received in Christ Jesus he knows the past that we take. He says that after He has tested us, we shall come forth as gold. He bottles our tears. He loves us with an everlasting love. Nothing that you could ever do will ever change that. Your love will come and go, will falter, will fail. But His is steady. Dearly beloved, rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.